الآمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم افتح علينا بحكمتك وانشر علينا برحمتك اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وفقها في الدين يا رب العالمين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم We continue our study of one of the great imams, the great leader in our uh, Islamic history, in our Islamic jurisprudence, and that is Imam Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i. He is the third of the great imams uh, in, uh, in the historical uh, order of those in the time of their appearance, and that is Imam uh, Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik ibn Anas, Imam Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i, and Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, rahimahumullahu ajma'in. Uh, we, studied our, uh, we started our uh, study with uh, a brief uh, synopsis, and we repeat that, inshallah, for the benefit of the brothers and the sisters that were not with us in the last two sessions. And this is the third session uh, about the life of this great Imam, rahimahullah. And that is, we started with uh, who is, and he is a Qurayshi, he is from the family of Quraysh, and he's from the clan of Abd Manaf. So he is rel- related to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, we spoke about his birth in Gaza and uh, how he uh, became an orphan at a very young age, at the, uh, almost two years of old, or actually uh, before that, he came an orphan when he was only a few months old, but he, his mother took him back to Mecca when he was two years old. And so he was really, he grew up in Mecca and he grew up in a, in a family that honored uh, knowledge, honored ilm. And his mother played a key role in, in uh, pushing Imam uh, Shafi'i into the halaqat al-ilm, into the circles of knowledge in Mecca. And then uh, he was sent to the tribe of Hudayl to learn the eloquence of the Arabic language and the strength of the eloquence of the Arabic language, which is the key to attain knowledge for Islam as it is actually the official language of, of our religion. And then he continued his study in Mecca and from there he went to Medina where he had Imam Malik ibn Anas himself as his teacher. And uh, the uh, scholars and historians vary about how long he stayed with Imam Malik, but most say it was around 10 years. So he was really one of his students for a long time, and he got a lot of knowledge, a lot of uh, important uh, effect of the school of Imam Malik alayhi salam. And then he was, for a brief period, the governor of Najran. He was given uh, a position in Najran, which is in Yemen, and then there was uh, some political trouble that sent him to Baghdad, and that was in 184 after the Hijrah of the Prophet For In that, he stayed there for two years, and we will uh, see how, how those, those two years were very important in shaping the personality of Imam Shafi'i, who at the, till that point was considered a Maliki scholar. Until that point, when he went to Baghdad, he was considered a Maliki scholar, one of the brightest and most important students of Imam Malik at that time. However, we saw that when he was in Baghdad, he studied under Muhammad ibn al-Hassan, who himself was one of the most important students of Imam Abu Hanifa. So Imam uh, Shafi'i took a lot of knowledge from the Hanafi school, and he studied that in depth. Then he was back to Mecca for almost nine years, between 186 and 195, after the hijrah of the Prophet wasallam, And the historians and the scholars consider that the first period where he started establishing the Shafi'i school. And then he went to Baghdad again in 195. He stayed there to 199. After the hijrah of the Prophet wasallam, And he formed what is known in our history as Al-Madhab Al-Qadim, the old school of Imam Shafi'i. Then he went to Egypt, 199 to 204 where he died there, rahimahullah, and in Egypt he established his madhab al-jadid, the new school of Imam Shafi'i. But we will go over that in detail. And this map just to show us the, the uh, travel of Imam Shafi'i and how he uh, went to Yemen, went back to Baghdad, back to Mecca, back to Baghdad, and then to Egypt where he died there. And that really distinguish, uh, distinguishes Imam Shafi'i from his immediate teacher, Imam Malik, rahimahullah, who stayed in Hijaz. And we see that that really influenced the way these two men, rahimahumullah, ajma'in thought, and how that influenced their madhahib, their school of thought. 
Uh, we said that Imam Shafi'i and any of our scholars, we have been uh, following this methodology who was really uh, after the writings of Imam Muhammad Abu Zahra that any Imam is, is really uh, any great personality, if you will, is a result of four things. His personal attributes of that particular person, the teachers and the mentors that that Imam was exposed to, the life experiences that that Imam, that great person went through, and then the circumstances of his time, the circumstances of the age that that Imam lived in. And uh, in our study of Imam Shafi'i and his personal attributes, we studied his intelligence and depth his eloquence and how he was a master of Arabic language. And many of the linguistic, many of the students of language would be in his halaqa, not to listen to his fiqh, but just to listen to him speak. That's how strong his, uh, his language was. And then his sincerity uh, for uh, the attaining knowledge and spreading knowledge for the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we stopped at a quotation last time when he said, Imam Shafi'i, that I wish, my hope, his, his wish, that he could spread knowledge without, without having the, his name attached to the knowledge because he didn't want any recognition. He said, if I can only spread knowledge without my name attached to it, I can get, still get the reward without getting the notoriety and the fame that uh, come with, uh, with that. So, so he did not really, he didn't want to uh, be known as the scholar, the knowledgeable person, the imam. He was doing this all for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of his uh, teachers and mentor, we saw he was exposed to Sufyan ibn Uyayna. He was one of the great fuqaha of uh, Madrasat al-Athar in Mecca, and he is sahib madhab. Uh, he was also exposed to Imam Malik in Medina, who was also sahib madhab, one of the great uh, scholars of uh, Madrasa al-Athar or Madrasa al-Hijaziyya, the Hijazi school. Muhammad ibn al-Hassan in Iraq, who was one of the greatest Hanafi scholars. He's actually the author of the major six books in the Hanafi madhab that are still the main sources of the Hanafi madhab until today. And then in Yemen, he was exposed to Umar ibn Abi Salama, who was an awza'i in his school, in his madhab, and Yahya ibn Hassan, who was Laythi in his madhab. So Imam Shafi'i was exposed to all the schools that, that preceded him that were known at his time. And we saw that, that there were two major really schools, the Iraqi school, which is the opinion school, and that is from uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and many scholars of the Tabi'een uh, to uh, the scholars of the followers of Imam al-Nakha'i and Hamad ibn Sulaiman. This fuqah of this school was transmitted to Imam Abu Hanifa when it found its form in the Hanafi madhab. And that was transformed to Muhammad ibn al-Hasan, who was the teacher, one of the teachers of Imam Shafi'i. And on the other side, the Hijazi school, which is a textual evidence school, Madrasat al-Athar, by many of the Sahaba led this school, uh, Zayd bin Thabit, Abdullah bin Umar, Abdullah bin Abbas, among others, and the seven known scholars in Medina, transmit that knowledge to Rabi'at al-Ra'il, Imam al-Zahri, Nafi' Mawla Umar, Mawla ibn Umar, and that transmitted directly into Imam Malik. We know Imam Malik was a student of all these three great scholars, Rabi'at al-Ra'il, Imam al-Zahri, and, and Nafi' Mawla ibn Umar. And then Imam Shafi'i studied immediately after Imam Malik. So we see Imam Shafi'i truly was exposed to the best of both worlds, was exposed to the best scholar of each and every school that was known at his time. And that put Imam Shafi'i in an extremely unique position and an important position that he influenced the knowledge of jurisprudence uh, forever until our day. And his life experiences was affected by his travel, his strong background in the Arabic language and his poetry. And in every session we try to uh, uh, read a few lines of his beautiful poetry, Imam Shafi'i. And one of his quotations, that if he wanted to be a poet of his time, nobody would really beat him. But he said, I, I, this, his heart was not in poetry. I mean, his heart was not in poetry. And he left us a really wealth of beautiful poetry after him, rahimahullah. Then he has strong knowledge of the Qur'an, and that is very essential for anyone who wants to interpret the rules of jurisprudence. And he learned that in Mecca, where the influence of Abdullah ibn Abbas, who was known as the interpreter of the Qur'an, was still fresh in that uh, school. And then strong knowledge of hadith, and the imam of hadith of his time, of the time of Imam Shafi'i, was his immediate teacher, was Imam Malik. Imam Malik, the, the author of the book of Al-Muwatta, was the direct teacher of Imam Shafi'i. So we see Imam Shafi'i, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has facilitated for him to get very important knowledge from its best sources. 
And now we're speaking about the times of Imam al-Shafi'i, and we started that in the last session, and inshallah we will uh, continue on, on that. The time of Imam al-Shafi'i, like we said, was the time of not, it was not a lot of political unrest. It was time of the political strength of the Abbasid. Uh, the unrest was really in a different uh, field. The unrest was the battle of the minds, the battle of the cultures, the battles of the melting pot effect of the Islamic State. And, and the center of that was Baghdad. Baghdad was the center of the, it was not really a clash, but there was a meeting of civilizations at that time. Meetings of thoughts, meeting of ideas from the Persian culture, the uh, cultures of the East and the cultures of the West, the Greek cultures and the Byzantine culture, plus the emerging uh, Arabic and Islamic uh, culture of that time. And then there was an emergence of the heresy and deviation at its, at its uh, pinnacle at that time, when we will study that. There was Zanadiqa, there was Mulhideen, there were people that were heretics, there were atheists, there were people that deviated with the knowledge that the Prophet ﷺ brought upon, upon the Muslim Ummah, and they wanted to reform it in the shape of the religions where they came from. So those who were Majus, who were from the Zoroastrian uh, tradition, they were trying to bring a mixture of Islam and their religion. There was also a mixture. We, wrote, we studied how Imam Malik and others, and when we were studying his life, how he responded to Yohanna Dimashqi, John of Damascus, who was trying to really get a mixture and, and trying to challenge the Muslims about many of the ideas uh, that, that uh, does not agree with the uh, Christianity. So there was a time of deviation of the, some Muslims groups, and we will study that in more details today, inshallah. But it also was time of the formation of the schools, the madhahib. There was about 13 madhabs that were emerging and on the Muslim uh, and the Islamic stage. And there was all within 100 up to 200 years, about 13 madhahib. And we know the, the remaining four of them. All 13 are madhahib sunnah. We're not talking about the madhahib of Shia and Khawarij and others. These are straight sunnah, but it was time of formation of the schools, the ideas. Uh, and the madhahib that these scholars were bringing about. And then it was age of documentation, age of writing, age of writing books, documenting. We know the first generation were writing the Qur'an and it was gathered at the time of the Sahaba, the great Sahaba of Abu Bakr, Umar and Uthman until we got the Mus'haf where it is. Then Umar ibn Abdul Aziz uh, gave instructions to start writing the hadith. And that was at the year 100 or 101 after the Hijrah of the Prophet ﷺ. So it took a hundred years, nothing was written in a, in a form of book. In a form of a book other than the Qur'an. And then the hadith started being collected in books after the uh, instruction of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, after the 100th year of the Hijrah of the Prophet ﷺ. Here Shafi'i was born 150 and his action was about 180. As we saw, he started forming his school 184. It was time of writing books and writing books about fiqh. This was not something that the Islamic world have never seen before. This was, now we, we can go to a library and we see hundreds of books and we see shuruh al-shuruh wa mukhtasar al-shuruh wa al-akhiri. At that time, it was, an, it was an idea, it was a novel idea to actually write jurisprudence, not as opinions and different fatawa here and there, but to actually have a book. And Imam Shafi'i, uh, not only mastered this form, but he was one of the pioneers that put the basics of jurisprudence, what is known today as ilm usul al-fiqh, the basics of jurisprudence in a book. And his book, Ar-Risala, was the first book in our Islamic history to study that uh, science and to actually put the rules and the regulation for that uh, particular science. It was also age of debate, age of arguments and debates and discussions and some of these arguments and debates were amongst the fuqaha themselves. Now we're not talking about only the debates between the people of the sunnah and the deviant groups around them. We're talking that there was debate within uh, the people of the sunnah, debate about should we follow the school, that was the greatest debate of that time. School of opinion or school of textual evidence. There were some people that are taking very extreme position to the Hanafi school, to the school of opinion, to the Madrasa al-Iraqiyya, and people that are taken very hard and very pos uh, extreme position in the Hijazi school, the school of Imam Malik. 
And when you read these, the books of these people or the writings of these people, the people of opinion consider Imam Shafi'i among them. And the people of Hadith consider Imam Shafi'i Nasr al-Hadith. He is among them. He is the supporter of Hadith. So in many scholars see in Imam Shafi'i as the middle ground, as the person that actually due to his life experiences, to his teachers, to where he was, to his travel, had a clear idea of this entire field and he started gathering from both places and he studied his, uh, the fiqh of Imam Malik and then when he went to Iraq, he went back and critiqued the fiqh of Imam Malik and he modified and he took what he, uh, what he considered as uh, the, uh, the, 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 the basics of his uh, school and he left what he didn't like and he did the same thing with the fiqh of Imam uh, Abu Hanifa. It was a debate among the fatawa of the Sahaba, what to take, how to take it, how should we do, uh, how, does any Sahabi uh, give a fatwa, does that consider the, uh, a, a source of jurisprudence, does that consider a source of our deen? What if the Sahaba disagreed? What if the Sahaba disagreed among themselves? What do we do? There was all of these arguments and we saw how, we will see inshallah how Imam Shafi came and he put some rules, he put some basics, some methodology, Methods how to do this, how to follow this, how to t- extrapolate our uh, jurisprudence from Fatawa Sahaba. There was a, a, a great argument about agreement, ijma. Is that actually a source of religion? Is, can, if, if people agree, if the scholars of one age agree on something, does that become a basics for religion, for deen? And Imam Shafi'i came and he brought evidences that agreement is a source of jurisprudence. And uh, we will study that, inshallah, in a little bit more detail. And also there was debate about the meanings of the words, like we said last time, and how uh, they, the ulama debated about certain words in the Qur'an and what does it mean, and how to, to take this into our religion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned quru in, in Qur'an about the mutallaqat, the divorced woman, they should wait for quru. The ulama said, what is quru? Is that the time of the period, the time of menstruation, or just the period, the time that follows the cleansing after menstruation? They didn't understand the word. They, they, it was not something that they used, and there was great debates about those. And there was nobody in a better position than the one that has the eloquence and the knowledge of the Arabic language than Imam Shafi'i to participate in that and to debate in that and to also put some rules about what is known as the Qarina, association between one more than the other, and, and a lot of other things that actually govern how to use the wording in the Qur'an and how to extrapolate from that rules of jurisprudence. The time of Imam al-Shafi'i was time of deviation, was time when the prophecy of the Prophet ﷺ was coming true. When he said, uh, my, um, my ummah will be, will be deviated, will be spread, will be disunited into 73 groups. And only one of them is the Najiyah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of them. And the others are deviated. The others Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take into account in the hellfire. And it was time of group, this deviation. And there was three major groups that are emerging and they were challenging the rules of the sunnah, the rules of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or their interpretation of the rules of the Prophet ﷺ was completely different from these groups of ulama, these groups of scholars, Abu Hanifa, Sufyan ibn Uyayna, Rabi'at al-Ra'i, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi'i. And there was some debates, some uh, discussions, and some uh, arguments, and some uh, coming back to the basics that these ulama had to go through. And these three groups were the Shia, the Khawarij, and the Mu'tazila. And inshallah we will try to shed some light because it is important for these sessions and the sessions to follow for Imam Ahmed to, to understand what was going on. To understand why these imma went into great length in debating things that some of it is relevant to our aqidah today and to our understanding and some of it it's not. But because a lot of these groups have went into... Uh, uh, in extinction. Some of them may, do not exist right now. Most of the Khawarij have gone except for al ibadiyah who are still present in Oman, in Oman, in the Gulf. The Shia, we know that they're still around. And the Shia at that time 
uh, were really not one group, and they're still not one group today. But at that time, there were many, there, there was, an, like we said, the time of forming Mazahab, the time of formation of the schools, the time of formations of the groups. And the Shias themselves were, were forming into different and, and other groups. The Shia is one of the oldest groups that uh, started in the uh, Islamic history. And they started actually at the end of the time of Uthman radiallahu anh. And they grew uh, bigger and more important during the life of, Uth- of Ali radiallahu anh. However, they started forming their groups and their sects and they started becoming more independent in their fiqh and their jurisprudence and their extrapolation of religion after the death of Ali radiallahu anh. After the death of Imam Ali. And they were... Uh, under a lot of oppression from the Umayyad and from the Abbasid. And that made him more, uh, push him more into a reclusive and more into an underground movement in its uh, jurisprudence and in its appearance. So there was a lot of uh, that and that really influenced the way these groups have developed. And they have basics for the Shia. When we say a Shia, in, in the Arabic language, the Shia is the supporters or the group around somebody. That doesn't, it's, it's not a bad word to say Shia. Uh, it is the, the, the people that are around a certain person that are their group, their sub, his supporters, etc. And it was started naming, uh, started being uh, uh, called the supporters of Ali radiallahu anh. And they have uh, two important, all the groups of Shia have two important principles. The first principle is al-imama, that they have an imam. And the imama, in their opinion, it's not up to the people, it's not for common people to decide it, it is not for the general ummah, it is a rukn of arkan al it is a pillar of Islam. Imama, to have an imam, it's a pillar of, uh, of the religion. And no prophet would leave it up to the people to decide who the khalifa is who the imam should be behind them. What does that mean? I mean, some of that may not sound uh, too deviant from what we believe in. What it means is the Prophet ﷺ has actually assigned a khalifa before his death. That's what it means. They said it is it is more, the imam is so important that it's not even conceivable that the Prophet ﷺ lifted up to his sahaba, lifted up to the companions. It is not conceivable that the Prophet ﷺ did not have strict guidelines about who his successor is. And they believe that comes to the second principle that they believe that that successor was named as Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anh. That that successor was named by the Prophet ﷺ. And in that they have a hadith that their scholars narrate and it's called the hadith al-ghadir. And many of us probably heard of that hadith al-ghadir khum that the Prophet ﷺ has named Ali as his wasli and as his khalifa. And he told him that you are the successor and whoever is your enemy will be my enemy. Whoever is your friend will be my friend. And they claim that Umar radiallahu an came to Ali and he said, you have today become the uh, imam of this ummah. Of course, that hadith is not supported in, uh, in our uh, books of hadith. But that is the two, these are the two principles of Shia. Number one, you have to have an imam. You have to have an imam anytime, at all time, and that imam is assigned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger. And the second thing is that imam began with Ali and continued to be in the dynasty of Ali. It is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has specified the house of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa with, and this imam could not go, be above, be, uh, uh, could not go beyond the house of the Prophet and the progeny of Ali and Fatima, radiallahu anhuma. And it is it's, it's absolutely ex, it's an exclusive club within that uh, clan, within that family of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But it is very important to know that the Shia of that time were different degrees and different grades and not on all of them were deviants in their understanding of the aqidah, in their understanding of the Islamic faith, or even uh, deviant in their 
uh, rejection of the uh, great Sahaba like Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman. Not all the Shia, even at that time, rejected the Imam of Abu Bakr, of Abu Bakr or rejected the Imam of Umar or rejected the Imam of Uthman ibn Affan. And there were there was a huge spectrum. There were moderates. There were the the main extremists. The extremists like Al Ghurabiya. Al Ghurabiya, uh, with the, the word Ghurab came from the from the bird the crow the raven, and they said that Ali is is the actual prophet. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wanted to send Ali, but because Ali uh, is so uh, in his appearance similar to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Jibreel got confused when he was bringing the message because uh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam resembles Ali kama yushbihu al-ghurab al-ghurab like a crow resembles another crow like a raven resembles another raven and that's why they called al-ghurabiya and that is the sect that there are extreme deviant and they lift Ali radiyallahu an to the, to the place of prophethood they said he is the, uh, the supposed prophet another ex- very extreme uh, sect is a sex that uh, elevates Ali radiallahu an to the uh, to the level of God, to the level of Allah subhanahu wa taala, and they say this is great kufr. I mean, this is no uh, no kufr really beyond that, and that is started. We will see that in the, in the Shia Sabaiya, they see that Allah subhanahu wa taala uh, uh, has uh, placed His appearance in Ali, and Ali is the embodiment of God. Astaghfirullah wa ala Allah wa andalika aluwan kabira. So there was these extreme groups, and there were the more milder Shia light, if you will, that only consider that Ali should have been the Khalifa, but it is acceptable that Abu Bakr was. It is acceptable that Umar was, although they believe that Ali should have been. Ali is the most worthy, but this does not uh, make that does not make the Khilafah of Abu Bakr invalid. This is a still acceptable Khilafah. So you see this huge spectrum, and it is really important to understand that when we speak of the Shia of that time. So what are the groups of the Shia? There was not only deviation among the Muslims into these sects, but there was deviation among the sects themselves. The most extremist of the Shia and uh, the, uh, the root of all evil, if you will, is the group of As-Saba'iyya. As-Saba'iyya, they're known as uh, the followers of Abdullah bin Saba. Abdullah bin Saba was a Jewish from Hira, a Jewish person from Hira, and he uh, was one of the, the greatest callers to rebel against Uthman ibn Affan in Iraq. So he was... Uh, per, uh, planting the seeds of fitna against Uthman ibn Affan, and he would elevate the uh, status of Ali, and he would say, we should unseat Uthman, we should kill Uthman, and place Ali b- b- instead of him. And he said, لِكُلِّ نَبِيٍّ وَصِي For every prophet, there is sort of a vice prophet. There is a, a somebody who is a supporter of that prophet. Like there is Harun and there is Musa. وَصِي Harun is Musa. And it is known the hadith that the Prophet wasallam, when he placed Ali in Medina, when the Prophet wasallam was going to invade, was going to lead an army outside Medina, he said, don't you want to be uh, like Harun was to Musa of me? And what the Prophet wasallam meant clearly that when Musa wasallam went up to the mountain and he led the people, whenever Musa wasallam would leave the Israelites, he would leave Harun to, uh, in, in his uh, place to uh, govern the, his nation in his absence. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ meant. But they said, no, that that takes Ali to a different level. That takes Ali to the, different, to the level of the Prophet. And then uh, he said that the Prophet ﷺ is not dead. And he will come back. And he is like, he said, how can you even believe that Isa is co- will come back and Muhammad will not, ﷺ? Isn't Muhammad more important than Isa for this ummah? Isn't Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the seal of the Prophet, the greatest of the Prophets? Then how can you say Isa will come back and don't say Muhammad will come back? And he will play on the minds of the new Muslims of that time. They were all uh, new Muslims, not exposed to the Sahaba, never met the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Their faith was not really deep and they were still affected 
by the cultures of their time, by where they came from, by the, the Persian cultures and other cultures that were at that time. So he would use that and he would form his followers. And they were the most deviant of, of the Shia. <coughs> and then, after that, when Ali radiallahu an was uh, killed, he said that he uh, is in, this, in the heavens, and Ali radiallahu an will come, and whenever you hear the thunder, then that is Ali is smiling, uh, or you know, and when, uh, that's his voice, and whenever you see the lightning, that's the... Uh, brightness of his teeth. I mean, all of these uh, khurafat, all of these uh, myth and and uh, things that, that belongs to uh, uh, you know some sort of uh, mythical story and not really belongs to the realm of a religion that came from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, where there is a book like the Quran and a tradition like the tradition of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Then the other group of the Shia that deviated after that are the Shia al-Kaysaniyya. Shia al-Kaysaniyya, after Ali radiallahu anhu uh, was uh, killed uh, by the Khawarij, then al-Hassan died and al-Hussein was killed by the armies of the Umayyad in al-Iraq. They said that this Khilafah should stay, this Wilaya, this Imama, this Wisaya had to stay within the realm of the children of Ali. And there was only one left at that time. And that a son that was left is Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiyya who was the son of al-Hanafiyya who was the wife of Ali ibn Abi Talib he was not a son of uh, Fatima Zahra the daughter of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam but then al-Mukhtar ibn Ubaid al-Thaqafi who is a man that uh, was from the Khawarij and then he uh, uh, then he came to be one of the Shia of Ali radiallahu an he was in al-Kufa when uh, Muslim ibn Aqil was calling for support for al Hussein, So he went into uh, the groups of al-Shia and the support of al Hussein. When al Hussein was killed, then he went and joined, he's a troublemaker, al Mukhtar ibn Ubaid al-Thaqafi, as you can tell. And then he went and joined Abdullah ibn Zubair, because he was wanted to join any rebels against Umayyah. Well, Abdullah ibn Zubair did not know what this man was about, and he, but he knew that he was a supporter of his. So uh, Abdullah ibn Zubair sends him to Iraq to fight the Umayyad in Iraq. And this man, when he gets to Iraq and he uh, has uh, the power in Iraq, he had the armies, he, dec he declines his allegiance to Abdullah ibn Zubair and he started calling for Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiyya. He started calling for Muhammad ibn Hanafiyya to be the Khalifa and to reject Abdullah ibn Zubair, who was the Khalifa of that time. When there was debate uh, and, and uh, battles and tribulation at that time, Abdullah ibn Zubair was the Khalifa as it is uh, acknowledged by many of the scholars. So he rejected the Khalifa of that time and he rejected the Umayyad of that time even and he called for Muhammad ibn Hanafiyya. Well, Muhammad ibn Hanafiyya did not want to be a Khalifa, did not want to be in this struggle and he rejected Al-Mukhtar ibn Ubaid al-Saqafi uh, in public. So then Al-Mukhtar ibn Ubaid started calling for himself, and they started forming this uh, sect that is known as Shia al-Kaysaniyya. Shia al-Kaysaniyya has almost, uh, it's basically uh, extinct. I mean, there is no group today that has that particular allegiance, but the ideas they place into the religion, the deviation they place is still present there. And some of that deviation is, uh, number one, an imam ma'asum. Now, an imam can do no wrong. Imam is exonerated from all evil doing. Imam is a holy and a sacred person, whoever that imam is. And we see some of that, the relics of that belief is still today in the Shia al-Imamiyya, in the Shia al-Ithna'ashariyya, that is uh, dominant in the... Uh, uh, in the areas of uh, Iran and uh, southern Iraq. The other thing is they started calling of a raja. Remember how Abdullah ibn Saba said Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa will come back. And then he said Ali ibn Abi Talib will come back. They started saying the Imma will come back. Imam this will come back. And that's when you see the relics of that and the belief of a Shia al-Imamiyya where they think the 12th Imam went into a tunnel in Samurra and he's coming back. And this is Aqidat al raja This is the saying that people, sacred people, holy people, when they die, they don't really die and they will come back. And they will come back to earth to, to achieve justice. 
And they believe, they started that by saying when Muhammad ibn Hanafiya died, they said Muhammad ibn Hanafiya is not really dead. Muhammad ibn Hanafiya is in the mountain of Radwa. And he has honey and water and etc. And they have many poets that were uh, really trying to spread the idea that Muhammad ibn Hanafiya was not dead and he's still around and he will come back to uh, take uh, over the Umayyads of that time. The third deviant aqidah that they put, the Shia Qaysaniya, that they placed in, in the... And, and this will transfer into many of what is known as al-Batiniya, those uh, groups that have uh, appearance on, on the outside that is acceptable by many Muslims, but their beliefs on the insides are completely different. And that one aqidah that they introduce is aqidah al-Bada'a. Al-Bada, but it's really hard to translate, but I will try to explain that aqidah. Since they're imams, have to be masoom. They are sacred people, they can say no wrong, and they are holy people. They believe that those imams can tell al-ghayb, can tell the unseen, can tell the future. So those imams will start telling people, okay, this will happen. Uh, you know, for example, we, the, someone will win that battle over the other uh, group. And it wouldn't happen. It didn't happen. So how could they explain that the imam made a mistake? Now, imam can make no mistake in their aqidah. So they said, and the mukhtar started that because he claimed that he knows everything. He claims that he knows the future. He said, Bada li rabbikum. Bada li rabbikum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed his mind. He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told me that he will do this and this will happen. But then Allah has the, has the power. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, is the great, is the almighty. He can change his mind. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed his mind. As if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as if time to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means anything. <laughs> the, the past, the present, and the future, and the divine presence are, are, this is for humans. It's not for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he said, Bada li rabbikum. And that is aqidat al bada And some relics of that are still uh, present in the Shia and some of the groups that are around the Shia. They also believed in incarnation. They believe that when the soul leaves one body, it will be uh, placed in another and there will be reincarnation and these people would have uh, different lives. So we see that the Qaysaniyah, which is ab absolutely extinct at this point, but many of these uh, novel ideas and deviant ideas that introduced to the Sunnah, to the religion of Islam, uh, many of it are still present either in an ex ex extreme form or in a mild form. The second group of Shia were the followers of Zayd ibn Ali, Zayn al-Abidin ibn Hussein ibn Ali, radiyallahu anhu. Zayd ibn Ali ibn Zayn al-Abidin, he uh, was the imam of the Shia Zaydiyya. The Shia Zaydiyya are the most moderate of the Shia at their time and today. And most of the Yemeni Shia are Shia Zaydiyya. Now, they really never uh, said, uh, never claimed that those imams can go up to the level of prophets or level of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But their imam, and most of their, what they are different from uh, the sunnah, mostly political. And uh, just to explain that, Imam Zayd ibn Ali, ibn al-Husayn ibn Ali radiallahu an, he uh, rebelled against Hisham ibn Abd al-Malik. And he was killed in al-Kufa. And his supporters uh, started forming this uh, group of Shia that they said, the imam was not, uh, that the imam of the ummah was not called by name. That the Prophet ﷺ did not name actually Ali or the imam itself, himself could not be named in person by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the description of the imam, and what are the description of the imam? He has to be a Fatimi. So that is uh, one thing. They have to be from the clan of Fatima from either the progeny of al Hussein or the progeny of al Hassan, And they said he has to be a knowledgeable person, and he has to be a general person, and he has to go out and call for his imamah. This imam has to come out, these are the conditions. And Imam Muhammad al-Baqir himself disagreed with them. And he said, well, if you think that... Uh, the imam has to be an imam and they have to go out and call for imama. Ali Zayn al-Abidin never have. And he said, our father Ali Zayn al-Abidin never asked for imam and never asked for khilafah. Ali Zayn al-Abidin never rebelled against anyone. 
So he said, then that takes him away from the realm of imamah. And in their belief, Ali Zabn al-Abideen is the imam after the Hussein. So the, the Imam Muhammad al-Baqir disagreed with them and they were, uh, they were left as a separate group from what later on will also deviate into Shia Imamiyya and Shia Ismailiyya. The other thing that the Shia Zaydiyya believed in that it is allowable to have an imam if they are better than the progeny uh, of Fatima, if somebody of that age was not capable of taking the imama, then it is okay to have an imam outside that. So they admit that Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhuma were true khulafa. They were khulafa and they, they, uh, they admire them and they, uh, they agree that with their khilafa. And one of the names of the Shia al-Imamiyya in, in our history is al-Rawafid, the rejectors. And one of the uh, stories that say why, how they will call that is when they came to Imam Zaid himself and they asked him to curse Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhuma. And he said, I've, not, I've never heard my father curse them. I never heard Ali Zayn al-Abidin curse them. And I'm not going to curse them. And they said, Faizan Marfudak, then we reject you. And they were called ar uh, based on that one narration. But there are other actually stories. The third group of the Shia of that time were Shia al-Imamiyya. A Shia al-Imamiyya, they said that Ali is an Imam bin Nas, that he was called by the name, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam pointed at Ali yaqeenan. There is no doubt that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam named Ali as his only successor after his death sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they said, مَنْ كُنْتُ مَوْلَاهُ فَعَلِيٌّ مَوْلَاهُ Whoever I was, his uh, master or his... Uh, uh, Mawla, then Ali will be his uh, master or his Mawla. And they agreed that the Khilafah of Hussein after Ali, and after that there was some deviation. Uh, especially after they deviated after the uh, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq. Now the Shia al-Imamiyya and the Shia al-Ismailiyya agree that Ali Imam, then al-Hussein his son is an Imam, then Ali Zayn al-Abideen is an Imam, then Muhammad al-Baqir, then Ja'far al-Sadiq. But they differ here. Shia al-Imamiyya said that Ja'far al-Sadiq uh, gave the imamah to Musa al-Kadhim. And the Shia al-Ismailiyya said no, it was given to his son Ismail. Uh, uh, that, and that deviated the Shia to Ismaili Shia, who are the Shia al-Ismailiyya and a Shia al-Imamiyya, who then developed to be a Shia al-Ithna'ashriyya, the Shia that we have uh, today mostly in most of the Muslim world except in Yemen, like we said, most of them are Shia Zaydiyya. And the Shia al-Imamiyya, they believe that there is 12 Imams, and those 12 Imams, like we said, Ali al-Husayn, Ali Zayn al-Abidin, Muhammad al-Baqir, Ja'far al-Sadiq, Musa al-Kadhim, then Ali al-Rida, Muhammad al-Jawad, Ali al-Hadi, then al-Hassan al-Askari. And then after al-Hassan al-Askari, his son, Muhammad, who was the 12th Imam, who was only 4 or 5 years old, and he walked into the Surbab, walked into the tunnel, in the city of Samurai, and he will come back. He will come back at the end of time, and he will uh, place justice on earth. And uh, it, uh, they still wait for him uh, every day at uh, sunset. Uh, before we close the talk about um, Shia, of the Shia al-Ismailiyya, of that sect, the Ismaili Shia, came the Fatimiyin, al-Fatimiyun, the Fatimide who were, uh, they, uh, were able to spread their word in Africa, in Africa, in Northern Africa, and then uh, they had really a huge reign, and they were able to govern most of the Islamic world uh, in their time, until the Ayyubis, until Salah al-Din Ayyubi uh, finished them off. Uh, any questions about uh, the, that group? Okay, Shia, yes. It is extremely important question, Jazakallah khair for reminder. Those imams, I mean, the, these, like we said, for example, the Shia al-Kaysaniyya, they say were followers of Muhammad and Hanifa. He rejected them clearly. Muhammad and Hanifa radiallahu anhu, he was uh, an, an imam, he was from the people of the Sunnah, Muhammad al-Baqir, uh, and Ja'far al-Sadiq were some of the teachers of Imam Abu Hanifa. We, the people of Sunnah, don't consider those a'imma, Shia. 
The, the Shia consider them Imams of Shia. We consider them the family of the Prophet ﷺ. We have the greatest love for them, the utmost res respect for them. We just do not have the beliefs that the Shia had, the sacred uh, aura that the Shia have over these people, that they know the future, they alamun al ghaib that they can do all of these things. This is not our belief. And they, were ne they never claimed to be that. And that is the belief of the people of the Sunnah. They are revered by the ulama of the Sunnah and they are greatly respected by ulama of Sunnah. We don't uh, disrespect any of them. The, la the other, uh, these are just a wrap of the uh, different types of Shia, al-Saba'iyya, al-Kaysaniyya, al-Zaydiyya, al-Imamiyya, al Ismailiyya. The other important group that deviated from the Muslims from the realm of the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, they were Al-Khawarij. Al-Khawarij were really in a unique position. They were part of the army of Ali radiallahu anhu. And they became uh, very displeased with the uh, politics of how the war was going between Ali radiallahu anhu and the people of Umayyah. And they were Muslims, they mostly were Arabs. Uh, a lot of the Shia were Persians, but a lot, most of the Khawarij were Arabs. But the problem is they were Arabs of the desert, Arabs of Al-Arab, if you will, and they had very little knowledge of, of Qur'an. They had little, very little knowledge of the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, And they started interpreting the Qur'an the way they could understand it. And they limited their understanding of the text to what they believe was the right understanding. There were no Sahaba among the Khawarij, but they would stand and debate the Sahaba about what this ayah means. I mean, they would debate Abdullah ibn Abbas, and he would tell them, I know more Quran than you do. I was with the Prophet wasallam with this verse revealed. I, I mean, the Sahaba would come to Abdullah ibn Abbas to interpret the Quran for them and to uh, give him some in, in instructions about the Quran. And these people would debate Abdullah ibn Abbas and his understanding. Say, you don't understand what that means. We do. And none of, none of them was uh, among the Sahaba. And they, in the battle of Nahrawan, they were fighting about two to three thousand Sahabi. I mean, this is, they came very early on. And they were fighting Ali radiallahu anhu. And they said to Ali radiallahu anhu that you are a kafir. And if you don't say you are a kafir for accepting the tahkeem, accepting the judgment between you and Muawiyah, then you are an enemy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we will fight you by the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And their motto of that time was, لا حكم إلا لله. There is no judgment except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the response of Ali radiallahu anhu, he said, كلمة حق ريد بها باطل. This is the word of truth. There is no hakimiyah. There is no ruling except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what they know about it, what they understood of it is batal. And there was a lot of debates and a lot of arguments with them and they rejected everything that Ali and the Sahaba Kiram came up with to trying to uh, mediate and trying to uh, bring the Muslims together. And that understanding of their religion transmitted into a sort of a madhab, a sort of a aqidah, that they said uh, that anybody that disagrees with the, that anybody that uh, disobeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a kafir. They had no, uh, they, they, you're either a believer or a non-believer. Now if you're a Muslim and you commit a sin in the eyes of the Khawarij and when they were started and they deviated after that, in the eyes of the Khawarij, that person that commits a sin is a kafir. And that person is doomed to hell. And they would go out, and but they also allowed themselves to kill many Muslims on the premise that those Muslims are not Muslims anymore. Because this, they disagreed with their interpretation of what they thought Islam was all about. So those who disagreed with them on the tahkim, that the acceptance of tahkim like Ali radiallahu anhu and, and, and the sahaba around him, they felt that the blood of the sahaba, the blood of Ali is halal. Now who killed Ali radiallahu anhu? Khawarij. They killed Ali radiallahu anh, and they sent Abdullah Abdul Rahman ibn Miljam la'ana Allah and he killed Ali. And he killed Ali radiallahu anh, because they felt that they were uh, true in their claim against Ali radiallahu anh. Ali was hasha lillah 
He was a rejecter, he was a kafir, and it was their duty of Islam to go kill him. And that's the deviant of, of their beliefs. Uh, they were, uh, I mean, there are many, we can go on and on about the, the uh, Khawarij, but it is important just to get uh, their opinions about why the Imam Shafi'i, we're trying, we're really studying Imam Shafi'i here, we're not studying the Khawarij, why Imam Shafi'i had to give opinions and rulings about those beliefs, because you had the Shia on one side, and you had the Khawarij on the other side. And the Khawarij believed about the Khilafah, that the Khilafah had to be uh, a democracy that had to be uh, by election among the Muslims, and there is no uh, group of the Muslims that is more worthy of Khilafah than others. And as long as the Khalifa goes by the interpretation of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, then he is fine. If not, then the Khalifa should be killed. And they really believed, I mean, they're very violent people. They really believed that it's either or. There was the whole world was black and white to them, and if you don't agree with them, then the, that Khalifa should be killed. Now the people of the Sunnah believe at that time there was strong opinions of our scholars that the Khilafah has to be in Quraysh, not in the clan of Fatima, but in Quraysh in general, as long as Quraysh is capable of leading the Muslim Ummah. And then when Quraysh is not capable of leading the Ummah, then it can the Khilafah can go outside Quraysh. And for th that actually is a different subject altogether. But that is one of the different uh, one of the differences between the Khawarij and the people of the Sunnah. The second the second important uh, difference that they had with the Sunnah that takfir that they were they were so easy to say the word kafir. Kafir, this is kafir, he's kafir, everybody is kafir that, that, that does anything that disagrees with their beliefs or makes or does a sin. If somebody drinks wine, then they're kafir. Now in Islam we say they're fasiq, they're sinners. And the doors of, of repentance are open for them. And if, what if they die and they were still not repenting, they were still drinking wine? We say in the sunnah that it's up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to forgive them, then Allah can forgive them. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to punish them, then it's the true justice punishment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has warned them against it. But in the, in the mind of the khawarij, that that person is kafir, he's going to hell, and that's it. There's no other, there is no room. There is no room for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness. And that is where the, the deviation in aqidah is. You don't place yourself in the position of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and tell anyone he's in hell and he's in Jannah. We don't know. We, we cannot judge people that way and it is, the judgment is only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the other thing is, uh, they, they said, for example, whoever does not perform hajj is a kafir. Somebody died without hajj is a kafir. The word kafir was so easy. And when they judge someone as a kafir, they felt that the blood of that person is halal. They can kill that person, they can take their belonging and all of that. And that, that was the extreme of the khawarij. And uh, they deviated among themselves because of different interpretation. When you make the interpretation of the Qur'an and the hadith up to you, then people are different. When the, you don't go back to the scholars, you don't go back to the sahaba, you don't study this religion as knowledge, as science, as something that you don't take for granted. You just read the verse and say, I think that means that, and I'm going to go by it. I'm going to kill me a couple of people that don't go to Hajj. You know, as long as and people don't go back to the, to, the, uh, to the roots of our knowledge and go with the, what the ulama said, and the ulama that are trustworthy ulama, the rightly guided scholars, then they will div they'll deviate among themselves. Because imagine that, every person had different interpretation, every small group had different interpretation. So the Khawarij were many, many, many groups of Khawarij. Azariqa, Ibadiyya, Najdat, Safariya, Ajarida, Ta'aliba. And I just really stopped at that time. Number one, I was you know, trying to read about all of these people and, and I got so confused and so lost. But the major ones are two, the Azariqa and the Ibadiyya. And uh, took these two uh, groups because the Azariqa, number one, are one of the most extremes and uh, they uh, basically extinct at this point. And al Ibadiyya is one of the more moderate ones and they're still present. They are still present today in Oman and in, in that area of the Gulf. 
The Azariqa, they are the followers of Nafi ibn al-Azraq al-Hanafi. And they said that anybody that disagrees with the Khawarij is a mushrik. And anybody does not go fight with the Khawarij is a mushrik. So anybody outside this group of Nafi ibn al-Azraq was basically a non-believer and their blood was uh, okay, to, they were killed. They were okay to kill. And they killed Abdullah, the son of Abdullah bin Mas'ud. But they, when, when you see them in their ibadah, Abdullah bin Abbas saw them and he saw that their foreheads were imprinted with the a trace of sujood. He said, you go to them at night and the, the, the whole camp is just with Quran and, and they would make the hajjud and they would fast during the day, but they had this understanding. They killed Abdullah bin Abdullah bin Mas'ud because he said that Ali is not a kafir. And then they killed his wife and killed the baby infant with the, that was in her womb. But then when they're going out of his field, they wanted to pick up some dates, one of them trying to pick up some dates, and they told him, how would you eat something that is haram, that you don't have permission to eat? So the dates were more important than the life of this great Sahabi, than the son of the great Sahabi, Abdullah bin Mas'ud. That was, that's their understanding of their religion. And they felt that the, the infants of the people that are not with them, also mushrikun. Now even the babies were mushrikun. So they, they really had extreme belief. I mean, the Muslims believe that the infants before, or the children before the age of puberty, even if they are children of anyone, they are not mukallafin. They are not accountable uh, until they reach that age. But they felt even the infants, and that's how they killed the infant of the wife of Abdullah ibn Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. And they will, like for example, anything that is in the Quran, they will take. Anything that is not in the Qur'an, they reject it. And we saw that some of that ideology uh, uh, leaked into the group that actually is alive today. It's called Al-Qur'aniyun, the people of Qur'an, which is a good name for a bad uh, belief, that we take Qur'an only. And they said that uh, the Zani, the uh, fornicator of their marriage, there is no head of Rajim. There is no stoning for them because it's not in the Qur'an. And as long as it's not in the Qur'an, then there, there is no head. So anything in the Qur'an they will take and they will interpret it their way, but if it's not there, they don't accept any other interpretation. Then the other group is Al-Ibadiyya. Al-Ibadiyya believe that the people that disagree with them are not mushrikeen. They are not kuffar, but they are not mu'mineen. But they are not believers at the same time. So they believe that they are kuffar nu'na. They are rejectors of the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sort of uh, uh, fusaq. And they said that uh, those who disagree with them, they uh, do not, uh, they should not be killed. And they don't take uh, loots except uh, when they fight with them, they take only their weapons, they don't take their money. So they had different and much more milder, much moderate interpretation of that uh, Khariji beliefs. The last group that was uh, important at the time of uh, Imam Shafi'i radiallahu an was a group that will uh, actually reach its peak and its worst effect on the Muslim Ummah at the time of Ahmed ibn Hanbal radiallahu an, and Imam Ahmed will be himself a victim to their uh, understanding of Islam and to their power that reached the house of the Khilafah, that reached the Khalifa himself. And that group is Al-Mu'tazila, Al-Mu'tazilite. Al-Mu'tazila, they started at the time actually of at tabi'in And according to most narrations, according to most narrations that the origina originator, the, the one that established the group of Mu'tazila was Wasil ibn Ata. Wasil ibn Ata was a student in the halaqa of al-Hasan al-Basri. Hasan al-Basri, one of the great tabi'in that we studied some of his uh, life and some of his ethics. And uh, they started discussing one thing at the time of when he was in the halaqa of Al-Hasan al-Basri, and that is the, the, uh, the problem of who, the one that commits a capital sin, Murtakib al-Kabira. And, uh, and then Wasil ibn Ata came up with a new idea. He said, لا أقول أن صاحب الكبيرة بمؤمن ولا أقول أن صاحب الكبيرة بكافر ولكن في منزل بين المنزلتين. He said that I don't say that the committer of a capital sin 
is a kafir. And I don't say that the committer of the capital sin is a mu'min, but they will have a separate, a different category. Well, what's wrong with that is, is he is, he is inventing something that is not there. He didn't say that they are fusaq and it's, they are sinners and it's Allah, up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, now this is a new category. New category that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't speak of and a new category that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not explain in the Quran. And that's how they started. And Al-Hasan al-Basri rejected him, so he isolated himself from the halaqa of Al-Hasan al-Basri. They said in the history book, فَاعْتَزَلَ الْحَسَنْ Then he became mu'tazil, became an isol- he isolated himself from the group of Al-Hasan al-Basri. But Al-Mu'tazila, they emerged to be a little bit more than that. The essence, the basics of Al-Mu'tazila is dependence on logic and philosophy in interpretation of religion. And this is really important to understand because in many, many issues of religion, the Mu'tazila would have the exact same belief like the people of the Sunnah. It comes to a point where human logic and human philosophy cannot accommodate a larger concepts. And by that I particularly mean Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be accommodated into our own logic. They said anything that does not agree with philosophy and logic, then does not belong in our religion. Meaning, if you say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be seen on the day of judgment, then they said, how can he be seen? If They needed to know how. They didn't care about just to take it like the Prophet ﷺ said, we believe, we don't know how, but we believe in it. They wanted to know how. And if they could not understand how, then they reject the whole thing. So they said, we can't understand how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be seen. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be encompassed in a place. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be placed in the east or the west or the, or the north. Then he cannot be seen. So they denied the verses that say, وَجُوهٌ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهَا وَجُوهٌ يَوْمَئِذٍ نَاظِرًا إِلَىٰ رَبِّهَا نَاظِرًا And they rejected that the, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be seen on, on, in, in paradise, in, in Jannah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the pleasure of seeing His uh, glorious face. Then they rejected, they said, how does Allah speak? If you say Allah speaks, speak for us means tongue, vocal cords, lips and teeth. Then if you say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks, then you, you are saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has lips like ours. Which is total, total chaos in thinking. They're, they want to understand how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks. And this is not for us to know. And one of the Mu'tazila came to the halaqa of Imam Malik in their early on form. And he asked them this thing that we, I think, mentioned last halaqa, but we'll do it for the benefit of everyone. He came to the halaqa of Imam Malik and he said, Ya, ya Imam, Ar-Rahman ala al-Arsh istawa. Kayfa istawa? He said, Ar-Rahman that rise to the throne. Allah that rise has risen to his throne. How did he do that? He didn't ask, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his all glory, uh, how do we believe it? He said, how did he do it? So Imam Malik, his color changed and he said, Al-Istiwa ma'lum. والكيف مجهول والسؤال عنه بدع والإيمان به واجب وما أراك إلا امرأة سوء أخرجوه من المسجد إمام مالك said that الاستواء معلوم to rise up is a known condition we know the rising up how things go up and settle والكيف مجهول but the how to is unknown this is in غيب this is in mystery this is beyond us we don't I mean if someone doesn't even know what العرش is the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is it? Nobody knows, nobody can imagine. And they want to know how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has risen up to his throne. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran made it very clear. He said, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ Nothing is like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever your imagination go, wherever you think, then that's not it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it an absolute word. He said, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ Whatever, wherever you go in your mind, to try to think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're not going to reach it. And that's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the Sahaba said, whenever the shaytan comes to you with these things, with these thoughts, with these words, just say, Amin to Billah. 
A'udhu Billah Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim. I believe in Allah. A'udhu Billah Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim. Just leave it up to faith. You cannot understand everything about Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, the Almighty. How can we understand the hearing of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala? Who hears every and single one of His creature. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, He hears the, the sound that the dark ant makes in the middle of the night on a dark stone. He hears all of that. In the Quran, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said, He knows every single leaf, tree leaf where it falls. Have you ever been out there in Memphis in the, in the fall time? And you see how many leaves out there? And just imagine how Allah, how you cannot even come to imagine how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows every leaf, every single one of these where it falls. And He knows everything in heavens and earth, on all these planets and all these galaxies. He knows every single atom of dust where it is and where it falls. And that is beyond our imagination. And the Mu'tazila rejected that. They said nothing is beyond us. Nothing is beyond mind. And that is an important difference between their way of thinking and the people of Sunnah way of thinking. Why is that even important? Because they came into a point where they said, Al-Quran is a creature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It cannot be the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah does not speak. Allah who gave them their, their speech and their hearing and their sight, they said Allah does not speak and the Quran is a creature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like us. And everyone had to agree or either be killed or go to jail. Because the Khulafa, the Khulafa became their supporters. And of those Khulafa were Al Mu'atasim, Al Ma'moon, Al Mu'atasim, Al Wathiq. Al Ma'moon, Al Mu'atasim, Al Wathiq. They reached their peak in their time. The uh, Mu'tazila had five principles of religion. Do we have time? We'll stop after that, inshallah. I thought this will go a lot faster, so I apologize. They had five principles. The, number, the first principle, and its appearance is great, it's called At-Tawheed. The oneness of Allah, the unity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now mind you, the Mu'tazila did not start off as a deviant group. They started as defenders of Islam. This is also an important point I want to mention. They started arguing with the philosophers, with the atheists and the, with the heretics, to defend Tawheed, to defend Islam. But what happened to them is they will take the methods of those philosophers and try to conform Islam into it. They try to conform Islam into the philosophy of Aristotle and Plato. And that is where they fell into mistake. They wanted to speak the same language that the philosophers spoke. And they wanted to argue with the, using the same tools that they used. And Islam is beyond that. Islam is bigger than that. And that's where they started falling into some deviancy. But their intention when they first came out, and that's why the Khulafa, they say, why the Khulafa would support them? Why the Abbasid would support them? Because they were their weapon against the heretics. They were their weapon against the atheists. They were their weapon against the Nadiqa and Mulhidin. And that is why they supported them initially. But not having enough knowledge, they ignored the knowledge of the other great Imams like Imam Malik, Imam Shafi'i, and Imam Ahmed. Now mind you, at that time, they had their own scholars, and there was no, I mean, the Khalifa and his palace and his Baghdad place, he wouldn't know that there is Madhab Hanafi. Madhab, he only knows is one of his ob, subjects, is, uh, his name is Abu Hanifa, but he doesn't know that, that that is a Madhab, and there are four Madhab of Ahl Sunnah, you have to stick with it. These were forming in that time. These things were, were just new ideas that are happening at that time. So they had no, they, they just had uh, ulama that were debating each other. And they took the side of the Mu'tazila and they took the wrong side. And that did not resolve until later on at the time of Ahmed ibn Hanbal uh, radiallahu anhu. So the five uh, principles of Mu'tazila, one of them was the Tawheed, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one and it is nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have a right or a left. It doesn't have front or back. It doesn't have above or below. So you see, when you start hearing that, you say, it starts off good. Allah is one and nothing is like Allah. But you don't start going into details about Allah. You take only what Allah told you. And don't go beyond it. Don't say this and that. How do you know? You don't even know. Don't think of Allah and to know how Allah is. Think of Allah so you can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did never in the Qur'an say, think of me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always say, think about my creation. Think about heavens. 
Think about earth. Think about my signs. Think about what I have created for you. But don't think of about Allah to get to the belief because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond Azza wa Jal. And the second principle is Al-Adl. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, He gave the servants the ability to create their own actions. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all just, then He would never let servants do sins that He would uh, prevent them from doing. So they started going into this philosophy about is al-insan mukhayyar or musayyar? Is insan predestined? Do we cre- what do we do with our actions? And there were many groups. Some groups said uh, a man creates his own actions, said no, our actions are obligated on us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were both wrong. And then the Mu'tazila came and said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives man ability to create his own. I mean, this is all philosophy and confusion. And all it does, it deviates people away from the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they started to uh, respond to those deviant groups with making this philosophy. That's how they started doing that. Uh, they responded to the Jabriya. Jabriya said that whatever you do, you have no choice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has predestined you to all of that. So they tried to respond to that. And the third principle was al-wa'd wal-wa'id, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, if you do good, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you for it. And those who do not do good, if they don't repent, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not forgive. And that is again interfering in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will. Then uh, they... Uh, believed in this thing that Wasil ibn Ata' called for, and that is the fourth principle, and that is al-manzil bayn al-banzilatayn, that those who commit capital sin will be resurrected in a different stage. It's not among the Muslims and not among the believers, and they uh, in the dunya you cannot call them uh, believers or kuffar. Now, if you go to the people of Sunnah, al-fasiq is mu'min. Those who believe in Allah and commit sins, they are fasiq. But they are among the believers and they're committing sins. Among the Mu'tazila, they don't call them fasiq. They said they are not believers. There is mu'min, fasiq, and kafir. And that in the middle does not belong to the mu'mins. They're not believers. And that's where there is a difference between the people of the sunnah and the mu'tazila. Their fifth principle was al-amr bin na'ruf, bin ma'ruf wa nahi an al-munkar, which is an Islamic principle. So that is where they deviated and that's when they made their brains, their mind, their logic and their philosophy is the ultimate rule on Islam and the ultimate rule on how things should conform into their understanding. And if something does not belong to their understanding, they try to twist it around so it would fall into that. And uh, with that, I will just have to really stop because we're out of time. If uh, someone has a comment, Jazakallah. They do believe, they're Muslim, I mean, they believed in the judgment day. But they had these, these two, three principles that were different. Number one, they believed that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, the, the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not speak, you know, one thing. So the Quran cannot be the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When, uh, they believed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could not be seen on the day of judgment. And the other major difference is that they had to judge everything by logic, in, in, in the, including the issue of freedom and choice of a human being action. The third one was this menzila, bain al menzilatain, this, uh, this middle solution. Well, it's a, I mean, it's a good question, it's a good argument, but that's how, and they were not easy people to talk to, meaning they were very, very knowledgeable. They were extremely intelligent in, in their argument. And many of the ulama could not stand, I mean, stand to them until these great ulama came. And we will study some of those debates, inshallah, when we study the life of Ahmed ibn Hanbal. They were very hard because they were knowledgeable people. They studied philosophy, they studied argument. Imam Shafi'i, we're studying this in the life of, in context of life of Imam Shafi'i, he said he hated philosophy and logic because of them. He said, the, and he was knowledgeable in logic. And he said, nobody, nobody should learn it. Nobody should come close to this knowledge because it would lead them astray if they don't have enough faith and enough belief. Jazakumullah khair. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wassalamun ala mursaleena. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.